failure, letdown, pain, frustration, all of these words resonate within teams who just can't perform the way people hoped they would. When we're talking about the Overwatch League, I think we can all agree these types of teams come into existence every single season. I don't love to bring up sore subjects like this, but I feel it's necessary with this particular subject. The teams who failed are just as important with the league's history as the ones who succeeded. The failures remind us that sometimes life doesn't always go our way. Looking back at these types of teams teaches us what not to do when trying to put together a successful campaign, and that's what we're going to spend today's discussion on. Let's look back at five teams who did not live up to their expectations or the hype surrounding them. I've got teams from every single season on here, and this is intended to go in a specific order. Now then, without wasting any more time, let's get started. Crashing into the number five spot will be the Season 3 NYXL. Now, when simply thinking about title aspirations, you could realistically fit any NYXL team on here. Every year, they always find a way to just fall short of their goal, and I think Season 2 in particular was really tough for them because they were many people's pick to win the whole thing. But I think you have to look at the bigger picture here. In both 2018 and 2019, the NYXL genuinely played well when looking at the season as a whole. There were some hiccups at specific points for sure, but they stayed fairly consistent. Losing games was a pretty rare occurrence. If you count all of their regular season games from those two years, including all of their tournament matches and the playoffs, they only lost 19 games total, I believe. Keep in mind that we're talking about a 60-plus game span over two seasons. Regardless of how those two campaigns ended, there still was dominance for the most part. They had the top record in the Atlantic two years in a row. They were always a threat and usually one of the best. So naturally, heading into Season 3, many people expected to see similar results. But as we all know, that was not the case this year. Now, a fair argument can be made that New York could have done better if they played in the North American region, and believe me, that's a very, very fair point, because surely more of their wins would have been free if they played in that region, but that's not the point I'm trying to make here. It doesn't really matter what they could have done or what you think they would have done. I'm talking about what they did do, and what they accomplished this year is disappointing for NYXL standards. That's part of the issue of being a top team for two years. A lot is going to be expected out of you. High standards are going to be placed on you, and this year they ended up wavering. But the thing is, going 16 and 8 really isn't that bad. Like, reasonably speaking, the NYXL had a pretty decent year. But again, you have to think about their standards. As a franchise that has built up a reputation for dominating, they did not live up to that standard this year. They are lucky they made it to the Losers Finals, or I would have considered Season 3 to be a massive failure for them, because they lost their fair share of winnable games this year, that's for sure. The reverse sweeps with Chengdu and Shanghai are very, very hard to forget. Given how long this core has been together, this could have been the NYXL's last chance to make it to the Finals. Some of their players from the inaugural season might be on their way out. Think about how little somebody like Libero got utilized this year. You'd have to think he would be interested in possibly pursuing a new opportunity. And how about Mono? He might be sick of the over-aggressive teammates leaving him with little to no resources. This might have been their final chance, and they blew it. This team is always so good on paper, it really is a shame. Literally every year they come in with one of the strongest rosters, and yet it always gets wasted. They couldn't clutch it up. They maintained that core from last year, they brought in Hoppo, who's coming off a decent season on Guangzhou, they signed Hoxel mid-season, and they promoted their coach who played an instrumental role in their 2019 playoff run. All of the stars were aligning, and yet they were nowhere near the best this year. You'd have to imagine that there were like four to five teams who were better this year. And what really differentiates this season compared to the others is just how unorganized this team felt at times. Being on the same page is usually what makes the NYXL so solid. They usually have fantastic coordination and discipline, but this year really didn't show that type of consistency. Hoppa and even Jonek to a certain extent were hurting their team. Regardless of how they finished, I view Season 3 as a letdown for the NYXL. YXL. The regular season was a struggle at times, and there was no appearance on the grand stage for a third season in a row. If you ask me, this was the furthest away they've ever been from achieving that milestone. In Season 2, they were one map away from taking down Vancouver, and in Season 1, they at least came close to pushing the Philly series to a third game. What happened this year? They fought hard in a losing effort to a superior Shanghai squad, and then they got rolled by a soul team who has a better grasp of the meta. This probably sounds dumb, but New York are probably one of the worst good teams I've ever seen in all of sports, and that is why they ultimately made the number 5 spot on this list. Number 4. 
the 2019 Los Angeles Valiant. As a Valiant fan, this is a pretty sore subject. Regardless of my feelings though, I can't deny that Season 2 was absolutely brutal. Saying they played below expectations would be putting it nicely. Coming into Season 2, the Valiant appeared to be in pretty decent shape. They were riding the momentum of the second best record in Season 1, and a majority of that team from last year was still intact. Besides Soon who departed for the Paris Eternal, the big names were all still there. Fate and Space were arguably a top 5 tank line, Agilities was starting to realize his true potential, and the team still had Custa's leadership. All things considered, the Valiant were shaping up to be a competitive team. While nobody really thought of them as title contenders, finishing somewhere in the top 10 seemed pretty realistic. And don't just take my word for it, that's what the experts were saying. Reinforce had the Valiant in the top 5 of his preseason power rankings, and ESPN had them top 7, I believe. The Valiant being a respectable team felt like a given, and there were even rumors of them looking good in scrims heading into week 1. But little did we know that only a few weeks later, everything would instantly fall apart. And when I say everything, I mean it. For a team that was supposedly doing well in scrims, they sure as hell didn't look like it on stage. While it is true that a lot of the games that they lost were extremely close early on, that doesn't really mean much because they were still losing and they still did start their season with 8 straight losses. The team simply did not look right. The Karivan DPS slash Zarya experiment was a complete failure, but most importantly, Coach Moon made the decision to start Kuki over Custa on main support. This was the move that temporarily ruined his reputation as a coach before the whole Shanghai thing obviously this year. He went from a top tier coach to a meme in almost an instant. To this day, I still don't really understand why Custa was on the bench. You can say what you will to defend Moon's decision, but you can't really deny the results when Custa did take back his job. And I mean, is it all that surprising? Regardless of the reasoning behind it, support is not Kuki's natural position. He played main tank for over two years, and now you're suddenly forcing him into a foreign role. In less than half a year because he signed with the team in September, he had to learn a different role that all of his competition had years of experience on. It doesn't make any sense. By the end of stage two though, it was pretty obvious that this team was dead in the water. Fate wasn't the same player he used to be, Agilities was struggling on Brigitte a little bit, and Iziaki was having a hard time communicating. A team that many had in the top half of their power rankings were sitting at a measly three wins halfway through the season. Now credit goes where it's due to the Valiant. They bounced back with authority after the break. They made some trades happen, they beat a few good teams, and the team as a whole felt much improved. Nine wins in the second half of the year speaks for itself. But at the end of the day, that still wasn't good enough. Because they dug themselves into such a gigantic hole early on, the self-harm they committed was insurmountable. What could have been a respectable season ended up being a fight just to make the top 12, and they were in a position to maybe pull it off too. All they needed was one more win, but they just couldn't get it. It's really a shame. They built up a solid core in their 2018 campaign just for it to all get thrown out the window because of some early season growing pains. While there were some bright spots that kept the fans happy, Season 2 was definitely a disappointment. They are a prime example of what it means to not live up to the hype. Heading into the number 3 spot, I have the 2018 Dallas Fuel. What a wild roller coaster year for that team. Given the emotional nightmare that came with them, putting them on this list felt like a must. I know we meme on them pretty hard, but the Dallas Fuel genuinely had potential back then. After all, a lot of this team was comprised of the envious squad who won the first ever season of Apex. Effect, Taimu, Harry Hook, Mickey, Chips Ion, Coco, all of these guys were well respected at the time. Those six alone got people excited about this team. And let's not forget, they had another OG of the game in Siegel. His DPS play and insane flexibility had the people of Dallas shaking with anticipation. And for some icing on the cake, they picked up Custa in XQC. And XQC at the time was actually considered to be one of the better Western main tanks of the game. The guy was literally coming off a second place finish with Team Canada in the World Cup. He was at the top of his game with his explosive Winston play. On paper, Dallas was stacked. All they had to do was show off some good synergy and maintain their composure, and Season 2 could be looking real good for them. This team has everything they need. What could possibly go wrong? Well, as we all know, pretty much everything went wrong. All you really have to do is look at their placement in the standings, and you get an idea of what went wrong pretty fast. 10th place with a minus 42 map differential? Yeah, that's pretty tough. If it weren't for the circumstances of Stage 4, I don't even want to know how much worse their record could have been. From what I can remember, Dallas were anticipated by a lot of people to be like a top 6 team in the league. That's how big the hype was, and almost right away, it all came crashing down. Three games into the season, and XQC gets suspended for the rest of Stage 1. To make matters worse, the few 
Fuel are losing games pretty badly. Even though they were losing to some good teams, they were still expected to put up a better fight against these teams. In Stage 1, Dallas scrounged up three wins. They came against the Shock, Gladiators, and Dragons. Both the Glads and Shock were literally at their worst at this time, and you know the story with Season 1 Shanghai. You would think that things probably can't get much worse, but you'd be totally wrong. Stages 2 and 3 were both worse, with Stage 3 having them reach rock bottom with a 1-9 record. Along the way, there was nothing but pain and suffering. The main tank situation was spiraling out of control. We all know about the famous Taimu and Mickey main tank memes. That was ridiculous. And Coco, despite being an actual main tank player, was doing no better. Next thing you know, XQC gets suspended again, which inevitably leads to his release. And there's so much more garbage in there. Thinking Seagull was not good enough was a slap in the face. In desperation, they pick up AKM, they trade for Unko, and they get Rascal, but none of it makes a difference. They kept plummeting into a bigger and bigger hole. Their promised roster of superstars was mentally boomed. The Empire that was supposed to be had already been eliminated from playoff contention with more than 10 games remaining. The team that was mostly comprised of Western players was a massive flop. For pretty much three quarters of the season, the players on that team were miserable. Guys like Siegel and Taimu were in such a poor place mentally, and there was so, so much drama. And Kai Kai made so many questionable coaching decisions. His coaching, in my opinion, is a huge culprit for why the fuel were so bad. The Dallas fuel disappointed so hard. Besides Effect and Taimu for that brief stint in Stage 4, the Envious bunch was not very good. They weren't who we thought they were. Yeah, sure, Stage 4 was great and all, but they were literally already eliminated from the playoffs at that point. The way they played during that stretch was how they were supposed to play for the entire entire year. Dallas were not what they were promised to be and everybody knows it. Moving on to the number 2 spot is the 2020 Atlanta Reign. Not much of a surprise with this one, I'm pretty sure most of you saw this one coming. This was supposed to be the Reign's year. They were going to ride the momentum of Stage 4 and the playoffs and be a top team in the league. The key pieces from last year were still around and they managed to make a few upgrades too. Most notably was the addition of Edison and Hawk, plus the contract extension of Gator. On paper, they were loaded. Erster and Masa were some of the top players at their respective positions last year, and now you're combining that with the Atlanta Academy tank line and a hitscan phenom like Edison. This roster had title contender written all over it, and it wasn't just me and other YouTubers like Wool and Dividing. This was the common consensus among experts. Platchat had them third in their power rankings. Wolf and Avast had them second. You guys get the point. If you didn't have Atlanta in at least your top five, then that was considered to be a hot take at the time. And the way Season 3 started for them, things were looking kind of promising, but the situation started to worsen at an alarming rate. Sure, they were winning games, but only against the scrub teams. Those at their skill level or higher were a huge problem. In 2020, they beat three teams who finished the year with more wins than losses. They beat a lackluster Paris team in the playoffs, the Valiant when they were mentally boomed, and the Mayhem before they got hot. Now compare that to the amount of times they lost to these types of teams. 11 of their 12 losses came against these types of opponents. In retrospect, it's good that they were only losing to the good teams, but at the same time, it goes to show you how poor they were against good competition. In other words, they were very unclutch. Lots of L's with no real accomplishments under their belts besides a winner semifinals appearance in the NA playoffs. And friendly reminder that they might not even be there to begin with if it weren't for the pandemic forcing a format change. At 12th place, they just would have made the cutoff so they'd be fighting for their lives just to qualify. This team always fell short. They lost so many winnable games. As I've been preaching all season long, that coaching staff did a major disservice to their team. Adjustments and game planning were not their strong suit, and it shows. It doesn't help that some of their big name players from last year were unreliable at times. Erster found himself on the bench a lot of the time this year, and when he did play, it was kind of lackluster. And Masa was not much better. It's pretty safe to say he had a down year. His Lucio was not what it had previously been, and his Brig was atrocious. Like with Erster, there was also a disturbing lack of poke in the lineup, and to top it all off, Dogman showed no signs of improvement. As Season 2 progressed, we all remember how Dogman slowly but surely got a little bit better, but he was unable to continue that trend this year. If anything, he might have regressed a little bit, and to top it all off, their team leader Baby Bay retired. The rain lacked a sense of direction. They spent the whole year trying to find themselves, which is honestly a shame. The rain could have been so much more. These guys didn't just fail to live up to the hype. They shattered the hopes and dreams of their supporters along with it. A potential super team in the making was nothing more than a slightly above average team on a good day. Given how excited people were about them, a high placing on this list was a must. And finally, 
Coming in at the number one spot is none other than the 2018 Seoul Dynasty. I mean, come on, we all knew this one was coming. This was arguably the most disappointing team in Overwatch League history. If you only recently started watching the league and you don't know much about its history, then you may be a little confused. So allow for me to explain. So back in the inaugural season, it was announced that the Seoul Dynasty franchise would be picking up a majority of the players from the Korean team called Lunatic High. At the time, they were the best team in the world, basically, coming off back-to-back back Apex titles. Ryu Jae-hong was at the top of his game during this time period. He was arguably the best player in the world, where he was coming off two Apex titles in a row as well as back-to-back -back World Cup gold medals. You also had Miro, who was one of the best Winston players in the world, and the addition of Fleta rounded out their solid core. So basically, the Dynasty were comprised of the best team in the world at the time, plus Munchkin, Fleta, and a couple of others. With a roster like this under their arsenal, the Dynasty were immediately propelled into title contender status. In fact, many were saying they were the favorites to win it all. It was a common consensus to see them number one in people's power rankings. And I mean, with the way Season 1 started, it wasn't hard to see why. They ripped off 5 straight wins to start the season and only narrowly lost to the NYXL after that in a 5-map series. They ended up finishing Stage 1 at 7-3, and three, which meant that they barely missed out on the stage playoffs. But it was okay. It was a long season and there were still 3 other stage playoffs to look forward to. And yet again, they start off strong. A 6-0 start has them all but guaranteed to make the stage playoffs this time. But strangely enough, they lose 3 of their last 4 and miss out again. But you know, it's alright. There's still two more chances to qualify, and it's not like the stage playoffs were important anyway. What mattered the most was keeping pace in the playoff race, and at the time they were looking pretty good to do so as they had a 14-6 and six record. You're in it for the long run. Just keep playing the way you have been, and you're a shoo in to make it. But as the second half of the season commenced, they were never really the same team. Playing below expectations and not making a stage playoff must have really messed with their heads or something. They weren't just losing anymore. They genuinely were kind of average. Capping off the season with a 3-7 stage 4 is not a good look, and only winning 8 of your last 20 kind of sucks too. The players who once stood on top of the world were now falling apart before our very eyes. There were so many individual problems with this team. For one, the coaching was terrible. Who in their god right mind thought it was a good idea to make Jaehong transition into main tank mid-season? It's true that Seoul were having some main tank problems as Miro and Kuki weren't really cutting it, but like, come on. You thought a support player would be the answer? And it gets worse, because even when Jaehong was on support, he genuinely did not look that good at times. The team also really needed the leadership of Toby, but his mercy was not up to par with the rest of the leagues. Munchkin's Tracer also proved to not be what it was cracked up to be. All in all, a promising season became a disaster in a matter of months. There were so many internal issues within the Seoul Dynasty organization, and it was really sad to see. This team didn't even come close to sniffing the championship. They literally didn't even make the playoffs. They missed the cup by two wins. To add insult to injury, they didn't make a single stage playoff appearance. They also went 0-8 against their two Korean rivals, aka the NYXL and London Spitfire, who were formerly their Apex rivals being LW Blue and Jisoo Busan. So much for being called a dynasty, am I right? Seoul crumbled under the pressure of representing their country by having what was, in my opinion, the most disappointing season in league history. When you don't even make the playoffs when you are the preseason title contenders, you deserve to be on this list. Given those expectations, putting them at number one felt like the right thing to do. They failed to live up to the expectations and then some. Well, that's going to do it. Those are five Overwatch League teams who did not live up to the hype. So what do you guys think of this list, and what other teams failed to live up to their expectations? Let me know down in the comment section. If you guys enjoyed this content, then it would mean a lot to me if you could hit that like button and subscribe to the channel if you're new. And feel free to follow my socials through the links in the description. You can also become a channel member by hitting that join button down below. And as always, thanks so much for watching, I really do appreciate your support, and until next time, this is ATP, signing out. Peace.